So, good evening and uh, welcome to the second day of our opening conference for the project Hybrid by Nature, Human-Machine Interaction. I'm Melanie Bono, I'm the Director of Programs of the Region East Asia at Goethe Institute Korea, and I'm very happy that we will continue with our conversation about main topics of our online exhibition tonight. I hope you all had time to explore the online exhibition already that was launched yesterday. I just posted the link uh, in the chat. Um, Hybrid by Nature, Human-Machine Interaction is jointly organized by Goethe Institute Hong Kong and Seoul on behalf of the network of the Goethe Institutes in East Asia. The curatorial concept for this art project and the program for this conference have been developed by Sabine Himmelsbach, Director of the House of Electronic Arts in Basel, Switzerland, in collaboration with Dun Che, Curator in Arts and Technology based in Seoul. Human-machine interaction shows utopian, visionary, or speculative approaches in art that explore the encounters between humans and machines. We have invited 13 artists from Asia and from Europe, and almost all of them created new works for this exhibition. The project is looking into the manifold ways how our lives have become intertwined with machines. Machines that assist us with everyday tasks, machines that we use to present ourselves to the world, to communicate with other human beings, to track our biological functions. And of course, how these interactions are more and more determined by mostly invisible algorithms that nonetheless shape tremendously the way how we perceive and interact with the world. On the second day of our opening conference, we are talking about the topic blurred boundaries, convergence of real and virtual spaces. While tomorrow on our day three, we will be talking about AI human machine interactions and on Sunday, the last day of our opening conference about Metaverse, a collective virtual space. Now, before I hand over to Sabine Himmelsbach, um, who will introduce the session today, please allow me some organizational remarks. The webinar is being recorded, um, so all the microphones of the participants are muted. If you have any questions, please tap them into the chat or in the Q&A window and the moderators and the panel will keep an eye on that and uh, try to bring them into the discussion if possible. And some of the artists are speaking in their language, uh, so we are providing simultaneous translation into English. So if you want to hear English, um, please choose the translation button and um, select English. Okay, and now I'm very happy to give the word to Sabine to introduce today's topic and panel. Please, Sabine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Melanie. So very warm welcome also from my side to today's session, Blurred Boundaries. Um, it was a great honor for me to have been invited by Goethe Institutes to co-curate uh, with Dun Chiu, uh, an online exhibition and the accompanying conference on the overall topic of hybrid by nature, human-machine interaction. And to have dedicated discussions on the sub following sub-themes to examine them more closely, as Melanie already said, the blurred boundaries about the convergence of real and virtual spaces, the impact of artificial intelligence on society, as well as its potential as a new artistic tool, and the transformation of the internet itself, the emergence of a collective virtual space, which is called the metaverse. Today's session is about our era of hyper-connectivity, where the old classifications of online and offline no longer apply. We are on life, as the Italian philosopher Luciano Floridi says, meaning always connected to the digital sphere, sphere as well. The digitization of our lives was further intensified during the pandemic and the screen was often the only way to interact with family and friends. As the distinction between online and offline no longer works, 
The distinction between humans and technical systems is also becoming more and more blurred when we are communicating and interacting not only with other fellow humans, but with bots, algorithms, and neural networks. The panel will reflect on the increasing convergence between man and machine, this new natural hybridity in which we find ourselves today. I'm very happy that we have such a distinguished panel today with two artists from the exhibition, uh, the Japanese artist duo Exonemo and uh, Berlin-based artist Sebastian Schmieck and uh, renowned curator Yukiko Shikata from Japan and publisher and art market uh, specialist from France, Anne-Cécile Worms. I'm also, and we are all very thankful that uh, Bishin, who was also one of the nominators for artists within the collaborative curatorial process for the online exhibition, has accepted to uh, moderate today's panel. And before Bishin introduces the panelists, let me briefly introduce her. Uh, I had the opportunity and joy to meet uh, Bishin already uh, years ago when I was invited by Kronos Art Center. So she's a curator and researcher based in Shanghai, and she serves as executive director of Kronos Art Center. She leads the curatorial vision of public programs at uh, CAC, and this year organized a series of public events centered around the exhibition, We Link Sideways, an online exhibition that Heck House of Electronic Arts in Basel was also a partner of. Other topics were quantification, game engines and values in online games, cyber performance, clickbaits, hacking, viruses, among others. Her curatorial practice focuses on the intersection of art and decentralized technologies. Last year, she co-curated the exhibition Crypto Manifold, which placed the technological topics such as DAO and crypto algorithm into cultural and social context for discussion. Jin's recent research interest is the entanglement of consensus mechanisms and the issue of its carbon footprint. She's exploring an alternative prototype to reconsider the ethical relationship between technological development and our environmental consumption. So uh, Bishin, the floor is yours and looking forward to an engaged uh, discussion with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bisin, and I will be moderating today's panel discussion. Uh, today's topic is Blurred Boundaries, the Convergence of Real and Virtual Spaces. We've invited four guest speakers uh, to join this panel. As Sabine uh, introduced, we have artist or Gizanomo, artist Sebastian uh, Shimik, curator Yukiko Shikara, and researcher Anne Cecile Wurms. Today's topic, Blurred Boundaries, focuses on the conflicts of the digital sphere and our hyper-connected uh, reality. During the pandemic, we were all confined behind our screens, and physical encounters were reduced to the minimum. And the digital sphere sadly became our most important window to stay in touch with the world. We are witnessing an underlying process of technology spurred blurring. Today, through our guest speakers presentations and discussions, we're going to dive deeper into what kinds of new cultural formats have been revisited and developed in this new normal and how communication technologies have impacted our human condition and our daily lives. Um, now, without further ado, let's welcome our first presenter, Yukiko Shikara. Yukiko is a media art curator and critique based, uh, based in Tokyo. He, uh, she is also the director of Open Water Committee, visiting professor at Tama Art University and Tokyo Zoke University. She is also the lecturer at uh, Musashino Art University and the Institute of Advanced Media Arts and Science. Since 1990, uh, Yukiko started focusing on border by uh, traversing art, science, technology, and society. 
Uh, she also curated and realized many experimental uh, exhibitions and projects since 1990s um, as an independent curator. Now, Yukiko, please start your presentation. So in Japan, it's good evening. And I'm sure you are in lots of time zones. It's nice to meet you. My name is Shikata. And today, time, space, and body intermingled. This is the theme that I would like to talk about. But before that, maybe the framework is a bit different. But this year, in Germany, an artist, Josef Beuys, Josef Beuys, this artist is celebrating his 100th birthday. And I entered this world because in the 1980s, around the early part, I discovered Josef Beuys and I entered the world of art. And Beuys, he says everybody is an artist. And currently, the internet in the network, people, each exert their creativity and as artists, they can engage in artistic activities. And including that kind of thing, it's a place, I'd like to make this a place where we can think about that. And personally, from 1990, with information flows as the theme, media art curation is what I've been doing. And this time in Hybrid by Nature, among the participating artists with Exonimo, and with Ubermorgen.com, I have curated several times. So in that respect, having these two groups join makes me very happy. And to match each error, I have interpreted Josef Beuys in many ways. If he were alive today, what would he do? I have tried to interpret in my activities. And in 2020, under COVID-19, once again, I am thinking about Josef Beuys. And what I'm going after, the information flow, this theme. So this is part of Joseph Voice's information flows. So Joseph Voice too, he had this hybrid by nature kind of thing that he was doing. Back then, the technologies and using the things available. So currently, how should we think about this? When I think about it, there's the expression ecosophy. It's ecology plus philosophy. It's a coined word. In 1989, the French psychotherapist, Felix Guattari, proposed this concept of ecosophy. And ecology isn't just nature, but social and mental as well. We need to think about it in that context. And, in the, and regarding this ecosophy, regarding this expression, from the early 1990s, I've had that in my mind as I've been active. And in the 21st century, nature and society and the mental aspects through digital, we want to try to take this one rank higher. And over the past 10 years or so, that's the kind of thing I've been doing. And I'm sorry to go on for so long. So this century, digital networks are spreading and making various modern systems come undone at the seams. COVID-19 has been the last nail in the coffin. And today is a time of great change. It's a crisis. And at the same time, it's an era of possibilities. And it's all up to us, in particular artists, thinking about the era, and thinking about things that are not visible, planning such things and making them into specific expressions. So artists can create a lot of possibilities and including projects like this in this era of COVID-19, targeting the future, new activities and visions will be emerging. And that's something I'm looking forward to. And in this presentation, so I'll talk about modern times and space and physical properties in a post-pandemic era. New relationships are hinted at in an online performance that I'd like to introduce. And I'd like to share the screen with you. And please allow me to continue without making it full screen. So time, space, and body intermingled. 
five times five times five legged stool. So this is an online performance, and this is what I'd like to explain today. And this is not curated by myself. I was just a spectator. Since last year, under COVID-19, online or combining online and offline, there have been a lot of experimental efforts, and I believe that this is the most important so far. And that's why I'd like to introduce it to you. And this is... So Ms. Chiaki Shinoda, so she's a playwright, and in an online performance at the Center, Yamaguchi Center for Arts and Media, she put on this performance. It was done on November the 22nd and 23rd of 2020. It was done only online. And this work, this year in May, the US dancer Anna Halprin died at the age of 100 and her dance score was used for this work. And her work was called Five-Legged Stool, it's from 1962. And already in 2014, Shinoda-san reinterpreted this in her work, Five Times Five-Legged Stool. And under COVID-19, at the Yamaguchi Center for Arts and Media, with, it's called YCAM, and with the Interlab, there's a lab, and there are technical staff there, and together with the tech team, this was newly produced for online only, and that is the five times five times five-legged stool. So it takes multiple pieces of time and space, including virtual space on the PC with multi-window view, and it's been edited real time with the audience at times taking part. And before that, I'd like to talk about the 20th century physical properties. So in the 20th century or modern time and space and physicality, mainly in the performing, part, performing arts, I'd like to reconfirm in modern times, homogenous time and space and humans were promoted. But since the emergence of movies in the 20th century, the time axis was also introduced into expression. Film records were not yet widely used in the early 20th century and in dance. Notations were born. So how do you capture dance in writing? So this emerged. And these are like music scores or punch cards of computers. They're a kind of program and could be called a three-dimensional movement score of the body. And in Germany, German Rudolf von Lavan in the 1920s invented the Lavan notation. And actually, Shinoda-san, in producing her work in 2014, five times five-legged tool, stool, she compared Lavan's notations and Halprin's notations or Halprin scores, she compared them. And she chose the instinctively easy to understand Halprin scores. And by the way, in almost the same era as Lavan, around 1926, regarding space and physicality, an important activity was by the Bauhaus, Oskar Schlemmer. And Oskar Schlemmer, he went after the relationship between geometric space and organic bodies. And this too is an important aspect. And Halprin's score, time-wise, was in the same era as the Fluxus installation art. And Fluxus itself, the instruction art, is poetic and fragmented text. And Halprin's was a dance score. And her husband, landscape artist Lawrence, and her assistants produced the score. That's what I hear. And it's a score. So therefore, with installation art, the purpose and the function differ. But having said so, the dance score does not mention time unit or each dancer's specific poses. So the degree of interpretation is quite high. In the 1990s, in the early era, a little before the internet became popular, the Frankfurt Ballet Theatre leader, William Forsyth, he's, he was a dancer and choreographer, he used CD-ROM, improvisation technologies, and with body segmentation and movement, 
as the basis of analytical dance, sharing it as a kind of program. And in the field, with this as the basis, there were wonderful performances that used improvision. はい、2019年の5×5コマースの演出は5人の役を含むダンサーが演じました。つまり、あらかじめ撮影された映像を舞台に重ね合わせて、同じ時間軸で5人の動きを見せました。本作品、今回の作品においては、まず今回に至るま
And then, after that, um, you take a photograph, and then you are asked to go out of the room and go upstairs. You get to the second floor deck, and then you find a PC on the deck. This is a notebook type PC, which serves as a stage. And then you are given a second role, uh, which is invisible feathers. So once again, and this is the last part, but you believe that this PC is a theater and we go up one more floor and you believe or imagine that you are invisible and you throw invisible feathers together. And actually, I served as one of the dancers here in this finale. So the flat uh, two-dimensional score of Halperin, and this was an online performance, but uh, people from different time space uh, were all gathered together in this virtual space. And also the audience joined in. And finally, in the virtual space, the notebook type PC is seen as a stage. And it was really kind of strange and wondrous. And this nested structure, uh, what does this mean? Uh, it, is it is quite difficult to understand. And Shinoda's uh, work um, is, in in is full of improvisation and has a lot of layers. And one person suggested, actually, it's Tokisato Mitsuru, who said the desktop should be seen as a theater. And so on top of the desktop, all kinds of things were treated on an equivalent level. And Fukutome Mari, or Mari Fukutome, a dancer, said that there is an emotional part and the equivalency on top of the desktop has been merged very well together in the performance. So the equivalence on the desktop and also the emotion, merging these things together is something that we rarely see. And I believe that this doesn't fit into any genre. Um, it's really hybrid by nature. So the adverse situation under COVID-19 has been turned into a very creative uh, scene. And so this was really one of a kind. And so this is Shinoda Chiaki and Futobe Mari on stage of the, of the PC saying goodbye. Uh, thank you, Yukiko. Thank you for sharing. Uh, That's very interesting uh, case to share. I have a very simple question. I'm going to save all the in-depth uh, discussion later. Uh, uh, this question is, I wonder, uh, could you please tell us more about people's reaction uh, to this performance and how was the interaction between the performers and uh, like, or between the performers and the audience also between the audience and how, how would you evaluate this kind of uh, interaction experience? Thank you. Let me see, it's online, so it's a little difficult to tell. But actually, we did not share the real space together, so we don't know who the counterpart is. And you go in yourself, and all of a sudden, it's all you can do to take action yourself. So there was not much leeway, which means with other people, you didn't really know what the others were doing. It was difficult to see in detail. But this was a strange situation, and sharing this strange situation had this strange sense of fun and being able to share this this time, I think, was important. Thank you, Yukiko. Um, now let's welcome our next guest speaker, uh, Exanomo. Exanomo is formed by uh, symbol Kensuke and Akaiwaie uh, Aka in 1996 on the internet. Their experimental projects are typically uh, hu humorous and innovative explo uh, explorations of the paradoxes of digital and analog computer networked and 
uh, actual environment in our lives. They have been organizing the IDPW gatherings and Internet Yami Ichi since 2012. Internet Yami Ichi is an internet black market where people mm -hmm. can share and buy internet related things in real life. Last year, we also organized an Internet Yami Ichi event at Kronas App Center. Um, we also show their work uh, zero to one, one to zero in our previous exhibition, We Link Setways. I, I am particularly interested, interested in how they present the materiality of the internet and how they consider the internet as a tangible form. Also looking forward to knowing more about your new project in Hyper by Nature. So Examinal, the floor is yours. Hello, this is Exanimo. So being able to uh, being invited to this wonderful event is a great honor. Thank you. Now, today we are making a presentation and the work that we are presenting this time, Distance Between Two, and it's only online. You can only experience it online. And we want to introduce this and we want to introduce some works from the past that are linked to the current work. We'd like to share our screen and give our presentation. Let me do it again. Excuse me. I think, yes, I think we've been able to do it. Okay, let's give it a try. There's going to be some sound. There should be some sound. I'm a little worried as to whether we will have audio, but let's go forward. So may I speak? Should I talk? Yes, go ahead. All right. So today's theme, so the theme of the work is distance. And today's theme is closing the distance. The distance becomes a little closer. That's what we'd like to talk about. So these are physical senses, and they've been extended into virtual space. This situation is happening right now, and what we're talking about is related to that. First, this work. And HEK in Basel. The House of Electronic Arts. This was commissioned work for HEK. It's called Realm. And it just so happens in 2020, when the pandemic had started and we were in New York. And at the time, New York was locked down. And during the lockdown, we produced this work and announced it. And what is this work? So you can experience it. So if you have a smartphone, Please read this QR code using your smartphone. And to explain very briefly, you can access using your smartphone. It's the same address. But when you access through a smartphone, and if you access through a laptop, you get different screens. You can experience different screens. And maybe if you are accessing using your smartphone, then we will access using our desktop. <laughs> so if you access using your desktop, you get a photograph like this. If you access using your smartphone, you only get a blurred screen. But with a smartphone, you can touch the screen. If you touch it, you will see a fingerprint. And that fingerprint will be sent to the internet. And you can see a bit of movement here. So what's moving now is the fingerprints of people touching the screens of their smartphones. And from the desktop, you cannot touch the screen. And you can see words underneath. It says you can't touch there from your desktop. If you click on there, then a link is shared with your mobile phone. And from both, from your desktop and from your mobile phone, you can access from both. That's the kind of work it is. And at the time of the lockdown, there, it was difficult to go outside. And in the neighborhood, there was a graveyard, there was a big cemetery, 
and we used to go there every day to take a walk. And these are the photographs that we took and we showed them. And in the middle area, you cannot see it. And it's covered by the fingerprints of people touching their smartphones. So what we wanted to do was, at that time, so touching things means you might get infected. It was a risky situation. And online, so back then, touching things was dangerous and you could not come into contact with other people. So we went to the cemetery every day and we looked at the gravestones. And in the back, you can see the Manhattan ta town. And so people were living, they might get infected and died. There was the terror. And this was like a point in between. So technologically, it's not very advanced. It's not like that. But using a lot of technologies, it was like writing a poem. That was the feeling we had when we came up with this work. And let's go back. So a work like this existed first. And HEK was asking for online works. And for a long time, since the 1990s, we've been using the internet to create our works. And for a while, the real world, we've been there from around the year 2000 doing installations. And at the timing of the lockdown, net art, experiences you can only experience on the internet. We wanted to create works like that. And it just so happens that we were commissioned and this is the work that we came up with. So that's the kind of work this one was. Other than that, regarding our past works, there's a work like this. This is, so with the same kind of idea, we came up with two different works. One is called Kiss or Dual Monitors. We produced it in 2017. And that used two monitors, the faces of people with their eyes closed on the monitors. And by bringing them together, it was like two people kissing. But the theme of this work was two monitors can be brought together, but it's not like two people are kissing. The screens may be touching each other, but actually these two people are not touching each other. But when people look at this, they will imagine that two people are kissing. So we felt that regarding screens being part of your body, that's how people feel today. So it, there's an extension. That's what we were proposing. And the title is KISS, or it's only two monitors. So that's the name of the, the work. And we came up with a smartphone version. So smartphones are now the center of the times. And regarding this times, as a monument that symbolizes these times, on the right, this is the work we came up with, and we printed the hands using 3D printers. And the basis of this um, is, uh, this is actually the basis of our new artwork. Now, going back in time uh, with our artwork, um, in 1996, on the internet, uh, we created our works and we that was only on the internet back then but then after the year 2000 uh, we were living in just the internet world but we came out into the real world and tried to connect um, the internet world and the real world through our installations and from there the virtual space and real space digital and analog uh, these two different worlds and the boundaries in between them, we tried, we started to focus on that in all kinds of artworks. Now, we've been active for about 25 years now, but over the 25 years, uh, people in the past thought that internet, you have to connect through um, modem and you were reaching out to the faraway world. However, nowadays, you only use your smartphones. Um, it's in your pocket. It's kind of like part of your body, and you are always connected to the virtual world. And that's because 
and the internet has become a part of our body in a sense so then when you say body uh, it's your hands your legs your eyes your nose uh, that's the physical part and also your brain and the physical senses uh, that your brain captures but the physical senses is probably what is extending from the physical world to the virtual world and with COVID-19 with the pandemic all of a sudden this movement accelerated now going of course a little bit at 2011 uh, we had a presentation of the texture of the web or the texture of the internet was the theme of this talk and back then i asked the audience jpeg and gif uh, which has a harder texture that's what i asked the audience so jpeg and gif is just an image file format it doesn't have any physical being but i thought that gif was harder yes i think so too i don't know why but that's the sense that i had and so i asked the audience this question back then it was 50 50. JPEG, between JPEG and GIF, which is harder? The answer was half and half among the audience. Probably people didn't think about it in that way. So 10 years ago, people didn't see texture in digital um, images. But if we ask the same question today, probably the answer would change. So back then, um, 2011 or rather 2012, uh, was when he, we started with our new activities. So the texture of the digital object and the texture of the web, that's what I became interested in. And recently, we hear a lot about or we see a lot of ASMR or oddly satisfying uh, things. I think you understand what I'm saying. Um, from the visual sense or the hearing sense and more of a physical uh, senses. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a genre that we have. And maybe we can hear the sounds. I hope you hear the sound. So what you're hearing is ASMR. So if you can't hear it now, try to find it later um, on the internet, please. So ASMR and oddly satisfying. So as you hear, it's something that you really feel and sense. So ASMR is where you scratch a surface or you tap a surface. And I think you will find this on YouTube and on the internet. And it's strangely healing and you actually understand what it feels if you actually touch the same surface. Right-hand side, um, this is the visual version. Um, and as you watch, it gives you this soothing feeling. And this is actually distributed on the internet and as you see it and you hear it you feel this uh, healing sense uh, and somewhat soothing sense and these are some samples of images that tell us that our bodies are actually an extension of the internet um, 
President Biden, uh, sometimes he would speak in a very low voice like this as if he's whispering. And sometimes the whispers of his voices are just collected together. Of course, uh, speeches, uh, the contents are most important, but how the speeches sound is just gathered together. So now let's stop this. So the body um, is going back and forth between the real space and the virtual space, um, and that's what is happening real recently. And that's because the real space and the virtual space's boundary is blurred. And actually, our body is what is making that very blurry. Well, then what's going to happen after this? The virtual space um, will probably make the distance between people and people much smaller. And now that we have AI connected also, then we might have a new physical sense because of AI. And so um, as we've uh, thinking as, as we've been thinking about this um, we came up with our recent work um, which is this and this time it is an online artwork so when people access this uh, you can access this through your camera so under the pandemic um, just like this, um, everything may be on Zoom, and we have a lot of online conferences. It's, it's it's becoming a new normal. But in the online conference, you see faces on the screen, everybody looking your way. And um, when you have a drink uh, or party, a Zoom party, um, you will be drinking as you face many people. But we thought that maybe we can play with this. And based on that idea, and also the kissing screens, the kissing iPhones, um, those two ideas merged together so that everybody can um, experience that sensation. So if you access this and you turn on your video and you invite somebody else, um, you'll be able to see the two boxes getting closer and closer together and the distance will disappear. And this is just one sample. Um, it's all about what you feel with this. And what is it that you imagine from this is still, and we are still experimenting with this. But we thought that we can utilize this video chat system. And maybe use video like that for the online theater that uh, Ms. Shikata has introduced to us. Maybe we can have a lot of these experiments uh, using this, and this is just one sample of what you might be able to do with this. So that's all regarding our explanations. Is there anything you want to add? No, I think we're fine. So online, you can experience this. So please invite someone else and try try it out. There are two modes. There's the private mode. So you can create your own room, invite people, and experience it with people that you know. And then there's the public mode. So people who just happen to come in, you're matched, matched up with them. So someone that you do not know at all, a stranger, might be linked up with you. I would want to do that. No, I, I'm too scared to do that. I haven't done it yet. I don't know when I'll be able to do that. So our physical senses haven't gone that far yet, but please try it out. Okay, that's all from us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sambo and Akaiwa. Uh, this very uh, interesting project. I also tried the project with um, Iris yesterday. Uh, also, it's very interesting when you uh -huh. mention uh, how we see things differently depends on different size of screens. Uh, it also echoes uh, Yukiko sharing. As we are a little bit, uh, this presentation a little bit long, so I want to save my question about intimacy uh, later for the, the, in the discussion uh, session. Um, shall we wel welcome our next speaker? Is that okay? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's welcome our next uh, presenter, uh, Sebastian uh, Schmick.
uh, in 2019, we also showed Sebastian's work, Segmentation Network, um, in the exhibition of Open Codes Connected Bolts at uh, Kramas App Center. Sebastian is an artist who investigates the algorithmic circulation of images, texts, and bodies. He creates playful interventions that uh, penetrate the shiny interfaces of, uh, of our network to society and explore the realities that lie behind them. Sebastian in particular focuses on labor, alg algorithmic management and artificial intelligence. So let's welcome Sebastian. Yeah, hello everybody. And thank you for the, the introduction and yeah, thank you for having me. And I will jump right away into my presentation and share my screen. Yep. So what I'm going to do next is I will be talking about something that I dubbed or called the aesthetic of detachment. And I will try to introduce it by showing you some examples that led me to conceptualize this thing or it's, yeah, it's, it's like a speculative strategy, which I also kind of explain and employ in the video piece, which I created for the exhibition. And yeah, I will look back a bit at stuff that I've been working with and, and research into in the past years. And one thing I've spent a lot of time with was looking at um, online labor and digital labor. So I've been looking at platforms where you hire somebody who is sitting somewhere totally else and you hire them through a platform to work for you, for example, as a freelancer on Upwork. And what happens on these platforms is that you as somebody working there become kind of abstracted into this thing that you can select on a website and you become a number, which is your price and your success rate or something. And then, yeah, there is an interface basically for you. You can be like, this is what the person hiring you can see. They can say end contract. So you can very easily hire and fire somebody. So it's a question of a user experience, how you design this. You can pay them or often you can just refuse to pay through these platforms, restart contract and so on. So it's a very abstracted um, thing where people working there become very remote, even though they come kind of close to you through the interface. And another platform that you might know is Fiverr. Um, it's a similar platform, but whereas on Upwork you say, I am a programmer or I am a designer, you can hire me. Fiverr intensifies this situation a bit because you have to say, okay, I'm a designer and I will make your logo and I will do it in three hours for five, 10 or $15. So it in intensifies this, but always through um, an interface that really kind of hides the person behind it. And these two platforms have really been winners of the pandemic. So the pandemic has created a lot of losers, but also quite a few winners who really profited from the situation. So you can see Fiverr is not that old, but once the pandemic hit, it really went upwards. Well, Upwork was super irrelevant for many, many years until the pandemic started and then totally exploded if you look at their stock. And we, we see this kind of relationship to, to people that we hire through an interface also in everyday life with yeah, ordering a pizza or some fries and then you have through an interface you can, yeah, trigger somebody moving to your house and bringing the food as if like you download an image but now it's something in this package on the back it's like you see like data packages moving through the city to your apartment and so we have this like as it's called like bl blurring boundary boundaries in order to make this work you really have to bring these things close together so you have to kind of turn the body into a computer that you can program and so with this device on your wrist or on your arm you can walk around in a warehouse you can scan things and then you can be directed into certain areas where you can pick up another thing so you become kind of a programmable body 
And I've called this thing, which I will briefly now mention here, is humans as software extensions. So you become really like software and it's something that we all employ and often we also are and you can be yeah, controlled through an interface and you become part of the software we are also uh, humans as software extensions when we are for example solve captures and doing that we train artificial intelligence so we just become part of the software and we're being programmed in a way which yeah, I have written about and made works about which I think is quite a, a problematic and difficult yeah, uh, development. So the idea here is really to kind of hide the laboring person and you don't have to really interact with it. And as such, you can also like yeah, lower the price that you pay and with a distance that it creates, you also don't have to feel bad about it maybe. And also this, of course, powers artificial intelligence. Here we see an interface where people are annotating data that goes into all that artificial intelligence, which I like to call laborious intelligence because it's really just a way to hide labor and it's not some magic autonomous software doing something. But it is not just that um, humans invest a lot of labor in creating artificial intelligence, which is never really mentioned, but there is another thing going on um, where people have to pretend to be uh, artificial intelligence or a smart device or something. So for example, a few years ago, Facebook launched uh, um, a new messenger called M. You might not know it because it was only launched for a few people, like a select group of people because yeah, they wanted to test it before they release it to everybody. And it was a very, very smart, intelligent assistant that would book a restaurant for you, order stuff, and so on. But at some point, people found out by probing it, by making it do some weird things, they found out it's actually just people sitting in the basement at Facebook pretending, pretending to be this smart assistant, where it's just like somebody sitting there as if pretending to be. And I think that this is to me interesting on several levels, but what I find interesting is here the relationship between the users and this device. Here is, is the video where Amazon launched their Echo. And um, what we can see here in this screenshot is like a relationship between the device and the family. So the device now moves into the home, they've just received it. And you can see they're kind of excited from the, the man, the head of the family sitting there, getting closer. The daughter also is like, yeah, I don't know, uh, strong enough to, to come closer, but the wife has to hide behind the sofa because like, oh, there's this thing, I don't know. So you can already see the power relationships happening here and the, the, the respect they have for this device. And um, this is something totally different to when you imagine they would have somebody moving into their apartment and helping them like a, a, a human being. They would not have that much respect for that human being and, 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 and yeah, it would be super different. So we can see here, the relationship with a smart device is way more like um, um, characterized by respect and also like maybe allowing the device to make mistakes and you don't get angry, but that you think, okay, it's okay. The thing has potential. It will eventually reach its full potential and will be a super smart thing. Just give it some time, which you would never do with a person making mistakes in your home. And this also is being done um, in, a, yeah, in a way that is a bit stranger and more obvious what is going on here. This is a concept for a remote controlled robot that you can bring into your apartment and it will do laundry and stuff like this, but it's not really a robot. It just looks like a robot, but in fact, there is somebody sitting somewhere else, probably getting very little money controlling that robot, but you don't have to interact with that person. So you can really still interact with the robot, which brings yeah, some certain advantages with it. And to just briefly say here, Amazon Echo, there's also people sitting basically inside the Amazon Echo because as we learned later, um, 
Amazon records the conversations and if Amazon Echo doesn't understand what you're saying, it goes to a person that tries to transcribe it and understand it. Another example where we can see this relationship, it's this cute self-driving robot where you can see a kid getting close to it, sitting there, talking, looking at it. But actually this thing which is marketed as a self-driving food delivery robot is remotely controlled by people sitting in Colombia, so far apart, far away, and they're remotely controlling this thing. But the relationship with it is totally different to if it was a person. And to, to, to yeah, summarize this a bit, so we have humans as software extensions that I introduced earlier is um, people that you can yeah, hire remotely or that work as part of software that you can install like a software extension in your browser and also remove again. And then they often have to create or even pretend to be smart things. And if we encounter smart things, we have a totally different relationship to these devices um, than if it was the real person that is sitting behind it. And if you bring this together, I think there is an, uh, an example that illustrates this strange thing very nicely. And it's a, a Twitter account, Horace eBooks. It's a long time ago that the account was active. I think, I don't know, eight years ago or, or, or more. And Horace eBooks, was a Twitter account, and there is still not totally clear, but the story goes like this. It was started by somebody in Russia who used it as a spam bot. But it gained, so it was like automated, an automated Twitter account writing weird things. But it gained a lot of popularity because the things that it automatically tweeted were so weird, but also so funny in a way because you thought, okay, a computer program is writing this, and this is so weird. And at some point it had a lot of followers. You can see here 140,000 followers. And then it was revealed, revealed that at some point people had bought the account and were starting to tweet themselves. So at some point it, start, it, it converted from being a software program to somebody actually sitting there and writing the tweets. But people didn't know that. And it's really like, if you read something where you assume it's written by a computer, you have this, um, approach and think, ah, this is actually kind of funny for uh, a, a computer to, to write. This is weirdly interesting because our computer has written it. So it's a really different way of looking at it. And for the people on the other side, they are sitting there trying to pretend to be a bot. They were trying to pretend to be software. It allowed them a totally different way of tweeting. Like they tweeted like in probably like a very yeah, non-consequential way, like just trying something out and exploring a totally different aesthetic. So it's a very different aesthetic if you pretend to be a bot than if you are yourself. And um, this is one side of what I've called the aesthetic of detachment. And the other thing um, that I want to show is a video that some of you might know in which Mark Zuckerberg and an employee from Facebook, they are demonstrating Facebook's VR. And um, yeah, let's, let's have a look at it without audio so I can explain a bit. So what we see here is on the left, Mark Zuckerberg and on the right, his uh, employee. And to demonstrate the VR, they virtually traveled to, um, Puerto Rico, which just basically moments before this demonstration was heavily hit by, uh, by a hurricane. And so you can see like it's everything is flooded. It's a super devastating situation. But in front of it, you can see Mark Zuckerberg and his employee high-fiving, having a really good time. And this is a really, of course, a bad and, 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 and problematic video. But what it made me realize is that if you become this abstracted thing, this part of software, so Mark Zuckerberg is not himself, but this really crude version of himself, like this interfacey version, it allows him to detach himself from the circumstances. So he's, he is kind of in Puerto Rico, but he doesn't care at all about it. 
And this weird thing he's doing here, I thought has a lot of potential if you maybe turn it around a bit and use it a bit differently. And uh, one moment. Yeah, this led me to yeah what I said, the aesthetic of detachment. So on one hand, um, we have like an attitude to, to smart devices, like we give them mistakes, we see potential in them, and we don't want to see what's behind it. And on the other hand, I think um, we can say that um, being a software extension can allow you to detach yourself from the situation that you're in because you become this abstracted thing and you can act as an abstracted thing. And um, to think this through, I made a video piece, which you can then see in the exhibition, maybe after our talk here. And the piece is called how to give your best self some rest. So what we have to do is we always have to perform our best selves, be like our smartest self all the time, for example, but there might be ways to, to detach ourselves from this. And um, as a last example, before showing you some screenshots, um, what I was reminded of the, the, the relationship of being, performing something, becoming software and doing something in real life, I thought was really um, yeah, easily to understand also in, in the context of using online filters or being on Zoom. So there is this thing some years ago, it was called Snapchat dysmorphia, where people used filters on Snapchat to look better, to look more like the norm, to look prettier if, if you want, if that's really true. And then, you realize, yeah, but if I turn off the filter, it's not, I'm not that pretty, that perfect, that best self anymore. And so they turn to plastic surgery to really be that thing. So there is a really powerful uh, dimension to using filters. And of course, this thing is also happening now. Zoom dysmorphia, you can see it yourself when you're on Zoom. You look at yourself all the time. You look weird. You don't look perfect. And so you become depressed and turn to plastic surgery or some other way of optimizing yourself. But I think, and this is something I'm exploring in the video, that um, you can also use other kinds of filters. So I have made these filters where you are a smart device. I have made a Roomba. Uh, there is this little Kiwi robot that I talked about or a Google Home device. And I made a video in which I use these filters and talk a bit about the aesthetic of the de de um, detachment. Because I think, as I said, it's like a, it's a, it's a self-help video. And as I said, I, I try to show how it helps you to detach from these situations where you have to, to be a perfect self all the time, because if you are a smart device, people really forgive mistakes and see potential in you. And to come to the end, so the, the, the piece isn't only about pretending to be a Roomba or something, but actually I'm trying to talk about some really like some life hacks, how to solve the problem with email, how to solve the problem when you are at home, but don't want to go out and so on. But if, of course it's speculative, it's, it's of course it's super naive and um, it's just like yeah to 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 get some discussion going maybe and yeah you can look at the piece yourself uh, on this website how to give your best self some rest and to me yeah the url is always a big important part of the artwork thank you uh, thank you Thank you, Sebastian. Um, I think it's very interesting to see we have uh, two opinions here. When uh, Gizanamo mentioned uh, the technology of the internet as being the extension of our bodies, and the Sebastian mentioned uh, that humans are the extensions of software. Uh, I have a quick question here. And how do you see artificial intelligence and automation developing in the context of digital labor? Yeah, so what we can see is that artificial intelligence, as I said, I don't think we don't, we, we have artificial intelligence, we just have like structures that uh, exploit people, and then you market it as uh, artificial intelligence. But what I think is going to happen is that these systems, algorithmic systems are going to be used to, um, as management, to make people work harder, 
to fire people if they don't meet the 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 quota and so on so i think this is the 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 biggest thing happening here but of course um yeah we also use it as a, as a way to i mean it also is nice for making interfaces that you can talk to and so on and i think this will yeah probably move into many more homes than than we have now Okay, thank you. Uh, I have more questions, but I want to save them for a uh, discussion session. Um, last but not least, let's welcome our last presenter, Anne-Cecile Warrens. Anne-Cecile Warrens is the co-founder and president of Art Jewels. She has been publishing uh, MCD, the printed magazine of digital cultures, from 2003 to 2016. In 2009, she founded the startup Art to Machine and launched Makery in June 2014, um, which is an online media for all apps. Makery is currently leading a European uh, cooperation about art and, uh, art and medicine. Uh, apart from art tubes, uh, 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 Anne Cecile also uh, has been named chair of Arteno Council of Artists, an NFT platform linked to the uh, Cardano blockchain. Uh, blockchain. Um, now let's welcome Anne-Cecil to start her presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, it was very interesting to hear the presentation before. My um, talk today will be on two topics. First, uh, I would speak about what um, we have called in the past new aesthetic, um, which is a term coined by James Bridle in 2011, um, corresponding to the blending of physical and virtual worlds. Um, and then I will speak about uh, this incredible revolution of the art market online. We speak about blurred um, boundaries, but the art market was the last one to understand what uh, would be the benefits of having an online uh, strong uh, presence. And the um, NFT revolution has changed everything. So I will begin um, with this idea of new aesthetic. And um, I will uh, introduce that. For me, the best keynote you should all uh, watch if you look at the past. It's a keynote by uh, James Bridle called Waving at the machines. And, you know, James Bridle, uh, to understand what um, uh, digital was, uh, one of his ve very famous artwork was um, uh, to draw on the floor a drone, because then he think people will understand this idea of surveillance. And um, it's very interesting when you blur the boundaries between what you cannot see and what uh, artists make appear. So James Bridle, for me, is one of the pioneers of this uh, blurring boundary idea. I wanted to quote also a French artist from the very old days called Christophe Bruno. He did a series of uh, Wi-Fi uh, performances from um, two, two, uh, 2004 to 2017. It was called Human Browser. And in fact, it was a human being with a headset and a computer reacting uh, uh, as if it was a browser itself. The second artist, uh, very emblematic of these uh, blurring boundaries, is Aram Bartol. Uh, Aram Bartol did several projects. One um, was called Dead Drops. And uh, the idea of Dead Drops, it was if ever, one day electricity was cut, there was no more internet. Um, he was going uh, everywhere in the world with like this uh, device, um, USB key, and he was putting USB key in like a street artist outside. And you could come with your computer and download every images, music that the artist put on those, um, on those uh, USB key. It's the example of the blurring boundaries. He did another artwork, very funny. Um, uh, it, at that time when um, digital artists were, were trying to address the art markets, they had to create what they called post-internet uh, trends meaning that they couldn't sell online um, you know, a very easily um, an artwork like a GIF or a glitch or a, a, a short video. So 
they were physically uh, creating um, derive from their online artwork. And uh, Aram Bartol did that with very funny uh, um, CAPTCHA, you know, the CAPTCHA where you, you say you are not a robot. So uh, he was like just printing 3D CAPTCHA and selling that in very contemporary art galleries around the world. So. This was the time um, of the beginners. This was the time where net artists couldn't um, address the art markets. And this post-internet movement was a way for them to, uh, to address the art markets. So then you, um, of course, with the evolution of technology, uh, with the VR, with the AR, uh, we speak now um, of a mixed reality. And there is a lot of artwork. Exonemo showed uh, also at the Whitney Museum a very interesting artwork. Uh, AR and VR now are getting really like um, all over the place before only few people knew what they were. And um, I think that I won't speak more about AR and VR because you all know now this mixed reality concept. Then we speak about AI. AI is a very interesting also um, uh, new trend. Um, AR is, uh, uh, AI is used by artists in very different way. I, I will not quote a lot of artists, but maybe you should see online uh, Memo Acten. It's uh, called Deep Meditation. Or Refik Anadol, it's called um, WDCH Dreams. Um, it's emblematic artist um, using AI really in a very interesting way. And also AI is used by artists to revisit, uh, like the, um, to celebrate the 100 years of the um, uh, Philharmonic uh, Orchestra of Los Angeles, or to um, create an immersive um, uh, space uh, um, projecting uh, the past of a building. Um, AI is really, uh, because it's a topic of tomorrow, I'm not gonna say much about AI. I'm just gonna say uh, something about the art markets. In New York at the end of 2018, uh, it was the first sale uh, in Christie's of AI artwork by a French collective named Obvious using the uh, using an algorithm that they didn't even create. It was an open source um, algorithm and uh, they sold uh, an artwork for $4,032,000, um, uh, uh, 45 it estimate at first and it was the beginning of the AI art market. Um, but still, it was nothing compared to what we are experiencing today in terms of blurring boundary for the art market. The art market online has been really very slow to develop. Um, it has, uh, it has been years um, that we all expect uh, big newcomers to sell uh, art. And, uh, in what we experience today is that digital art is not selling the most. What um, art collectors are buying online is more very well-known signature like Picasso, like traditional paintings. That is really for now um, the main part of the art market. But thanks to the NFT revolution, uh, we are experiencing now, uh, what we, there is two um, art reports that you should all look at. The first is um, the classical online art market from um, uh, Eastcox, Eastcox art report. And I will quote what they say at the beginning. They say, the growth of, of the online art market has been quicker and more successful than anyone would have imagined. The art world shifts toward the clicks and bricks model. Christie's, Sotheby's, and Philip online only auction sales broke $1 billion in 2020, up 524% from 2019. The pandemic has created new ways for art collector to uh, see artwork and to buy artwork. Uh, the um, confinement um, create a, a number of online exhibition and viewing rooms, and uh, it was the only way for art collector at that time uh, to buy art. And finally, we also 
look at all the fares, uh, look at the cost for a um, uh, gallery, for an artist to travel, for the artwork to travel. So maybe the mix between big fairs and online art markets is also a good way to balance uh, the um, energy uh, consumption. And also what we see is a new generation of art collector coming. And it is a generation that loves the aesthetics of net art, aesthetic of glitch, aesthetic of um, uh, animated GIF, the very first aesthetic of net art is what have launched the NFT art markets. What is uh, for an artist very interesting in this NFT revolution, I'm, I'm going to quote the, the, um, the report also, um, um, the, the latest report um, uh, say that uh, technological epiphany, new renaissance, art market revolution, digital bubble, and of course, new speculative niche. It's really some terms applied to the art world, um, dive into the virtual world of NFT and cryptocurrency. It's an um, it's, uh, art uh, price um, report I'm going to um, quote now. And the latest art price, uh, um, it's online available to everybody. At the end of this uh, very interesting uh, report, you, uh, you will have a chronology of the NFT uh, sold uh, since um, one year, I would say. So I will quote um, just uh, some very interesting thing that all artists were expecting for years. Um, the blockchain revolution is a legal revolution for the artist because not only an artist will be able to save forever, I mean, until the blockchain stop, um, the, the ownership of uh, their creation, but at the same time, if they sell to a collector and the collector is reselling the artwork to the secondary market, they can have a return. And this is what all artists have dreamt of. This blurred um, online art market is uh, allowing artists to say, okay, I want 10%. If the art collector is selling to another person my artwork, I want, let's say, 10% of the, of the money back. This is a legal revolution that nobody would have uh, dreamed of a few years ago. Like if you have a collective of artists, if there is a coder, if there is a scientific, if there is an artist, you can split as a collective the revenue share of the NFT and it will be forever in the blockchain. So I think really for an artist, it's a, a legal revolution, but more than that, uh, it's also um, a way to sell uh, online directly and um, of course, Instagram was before NFT the way for artists to interact with the art collector directly. But with the NFT, it's a step uh, forward, uh, a big step forward. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some figure. The contemporary art auction, um, it's $2.7 billion. And the NFT is now 2% uh, of the overall art markets. Um, you all know that the first, during the pandemic, uh, this um, American artist called Beeple uh, was bored and uh, he drew uh, 5,000 um, little, um, you know, uh, image uh, for 5,000 day. And then he decided to sell this uh, digital artwork and um, Christie sold that for $69.3 million making him uh, the um, third highest price achieved by a living artist, which is for, you know, the traditional um, artist, uh, something that they, they are very reluctant to understand. Um, the guy who bought this artwork is an Indian uh, blockchain entrepreneur. But what is interesting is Christie said 22 million people um, who were assisting at the um, uh, auction and nearly 60% under the age of 40, which is really like the um, first time uh, such a public uh, auction was uh, getting together. And uh, it's very interesting to, 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 to assist, to understand. Um, I want to quote two blurred um, 
uh, artists who blurred um, NFT and physical uh, physical work. Uh, Bonsky, of course, uh, he um, got on the game selling an NFT of his work, Morons. Uh, this work featured an, auction an auctioneer selling a painting with the inscription, I can't believe you morons actually buy these sheets. And in fact, uh, he sold it for $380,000, but what he sold is the NFT showing him burning this artwork. The other very famous artist uh, that um, forced Bayer to question the value of art is Damien Hirst. Uh, he launched an NFT called the currency. And um, when you buy the currency, you have to make the choice of the physical artwork or the NFT artwork. It's uh, virtual or real, you buy the same price, but he will destroy um, the artwork you, you are not choosing. So speaking of uh, really blurring boundaries, I think this revolution of legal issues and also of um, uh, art market online is really um, for the people who are on the scene uh, since the beginning of net art, you know, and net art began like street art, people were putting online uh, artwork, incredible artwork. Some of them now are completely disappeared because of the technical evolution. But I would say this is um, somehow uh, um, a time to give back to the pioneers um, of net art because after net art, we saw this post internet, this uh, to have physical artwork to address the art market. And then again, now we are back in uh, the virtual scene. And, and this is for our place. Pleasure. I would put two or three other very prestigious uh, sales. In, in, in April, Philips announced the um, first multi-generational NFT capable of auto automatically generating new works. Um, Christie's offered in May, last May, the first tokenized Warhol work. In June, Sosby presented the first intelligent NFT capable of interacting with his owner thanks to artificial intelligence. And so it's a really uh, something to follow. Um, I, was an, I was named um, uh, chair of the Council of Artists of Artano.io. Why did I choose the Cardano blockchain that is not really yet completely ready with a smart contract? It's gonna come in the, um, probably a few weeks. It's because of the impact uh, of the blockchain. Um, the Ethereum blockchain is consuming a lot of energy and for artists, who are involved in uh, you know, this environmental uh, change uh, uh, action, it's very difficult to mint an artwork when you know what it's consuming uh, as a power. So I choose the Cardano blockchain because it's a less consuming energy uh, blockchain. I won't enter the, the, the process uh, of proof of stake and um, you can look online the Cardano blockchain and Artano is a very young uh, team. Uh, it's, uh, they are all like 25, uh, they are all European. And um, the idea of Artano is also to say there are not enough women, there are not enough diversity in this uh, blockchain NFT world. Um, we want to change that. The um, uh, 20 artists of the Council of Artists is really 50-50 uh, men and women. Uh, they are coming from the Philippines, from Africa, from India, from all over the world. And I think it's also an issue when you blur boundaries. It's like not to look at the art world um, with a European or American perspective only. Uh, the Asian scene is really active. Um, uh, the most investor in Cardano blockchain are coming from Asia. And I think it's something you, you should look at. And for all the artists that are listening, uh, to us, there is open application on artano.io. Um, the idea is um, we want artists to submit their work to also other artists. We don't want to have some people who just uh, want to make money. Uh, this is an art uh, project, Artano, and we want to have like um, this very interesting uh, movement, um, the NFT. 
um, the NFT art market began because artists were buying other artists' work, and you don't see that in other any in any other uh, art market scene. This is very interesting. This is collective of artists helping uh, one another and bringing the artwork to more visibility. So Artano is a very young project. Uh, we did just a, a one auction, and it's uh, it's the very beginning. But um, we will renew the Council of Artists every six months. And of course, uh, I would love to have application from Japan, from Mongolia, from Berlin. Uh, so I will finish like that. But it's really something uh, of a big interest when we speak of blurred boundaries right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and Cecile, uh, thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, you speak about the online art market revolution. Also, I have a quick question for now. Uh, how do you see the further developments? I think uh, it's gonna, um, all the galleries now are getting, you know, interested. So you will have some platforms selling physical artwork and putting just the um, uh, blockchain uh, uh, guarantee of ownership, you know. So it can be also for artists uh, selling physical artwork, uh, an interest to have uh, the proof of ownership uh, on a blockchain, mm -hmm. but me, what I think it's very interesting is the youngest artist and the youngest art collector. The diversity is very interesting. You know that in the art market, the women were completely, I mean, now it's beginning, but also Africa, you, you saw the African now Renaissance also in the art world. So I think the NFT will help uh, to have, you know, new creation and new aesthetics and also to question, you know, uh, what we are doing here. You know, uh, I don't know if you remember the first uh, James Riddle uh, book, he was publishing uh, from um, uh, his phone, uh, uh, all the geolocalization uh, and the, the book is named where where the fuck was I if you if you <laughs> see this book it's a printed book and completely like uh, anachronic compared to the um, idea of having your phone uh, following you all the time I think it's really this kind of um, funny aesthetic uh, uh, that we're gonna see on the NFT. What I foresee and what I would like to do is also to bring the real like tech artists that have been on the scene for years uh, to this NFT world. They are all reluctant right now because it's a new scene, but I think it's also a way for curator to bring renowned uh, tech artists and uh, with um, program uh, programmatic NFT, you know, we call that INFT in, Card in uh, Artano, uh, something you buy and you, you will not see what you get. You will see maybe it will change every day, maybe. So that also, it's a dimension very interesting that is not yet uh, explored like um, you know uh, all the trends of the history of art uh, minimalism can be really um, applied to the nft uh, so we have a lot to see to come mm. thank you uh thank you also thank you uh thanks to all the presenters for your uh, stimulating sharing i would invite everyone now to turn on your uh a uh, uh, video let's have uh, let's move to the discussion session um i want to uh first go back to uh yukiko and exonomal's topic and i want to echo to this topic with the relationship of body and embodiment in How We Became a Poster Human, Catherine Haley writes, in contrast to body, embodiment is conceptual, enmeshed within the specifics of place, time, physiology, and culture, which together compose enactment. Embodiment that refers to uh, how particular subjects live and experience being the body dynamically in specific and concrete ways. The experience of embodiment today can be altered and enhanced through robotic devices, implants, prosthesis, and VR. Um, this is also by now a commonplace that the topic of uh, the, the, the logic of computer has split the self, leaving in its multiple agents and selves capable of interacting with 
uh, various media at the same time by uh, multi-window screens. Some pessimist, uh, uh, pes pessimistic opinions believe that the logic of computer will ultimately lead to the loss of body and our control over it. While the other optimistic scholars have emphasized the positive aspects of the virtual of virtual technology and virtual spaces, people allow to um, adopt the role of the other in online games, uh, chat rooms, and dating platforms. Uh, we can take on personas that differ from uh, our own our own um, mundane uh, embodied selves. So I wonder, how do you see uh, this? kind of duality of subjects in the digital realm. And um, what's your opinion on the relationship of our uh, actual bodies and the digital copy? Should I answer? Okay. Yeah. Regarding what was just said, let me see. Through the internet, a variety of physicality layers already exist. And regarding Exonimo, I would like to comment a little bit. Exactly a year ago, they had a big exhibition in Tokyo. And back then, a certain art magazine interviewed them. And already, it covered a lot of things that have already been talked about. So this is like a middle ground, the body, and what's not the body, things like that. So there's a duality, but in between, we're gradually starting to see a graduation and it's gradually getting smaller or closer. That was what they talked about a year ago. And under COVID-19, this has become stronger. So this middle ground, this is an unknown ground with Exonimo. Between life and death, they talk about the line between them and intentionally, this appears in their works. Therefore, life and death. So it's, do you as an individual disappear or not? So there's a separate virtual, I don't know if you can call it virtual, but a world that's different from reality. Can you become a being that's different from reality? So in that respect, it's not just digital. And contrary-wise, with digital emerging between life and death, regarding how it should be. Maybe this is going to change. And in physical too, there are new layers, I believe. And in unknown areas. So the work that they gave, so there's the work KISS from around 2017 to around 2018. I was very much interested in their work. And I tried to look today, I didn't have enough time. I was unable to enjoy anyone. So. It was weird because I was looking at myself and I thought maybe that is one, one thing that's actually okay. But there's the private and public mode and in there, in a non-contact age because of COVID-19, in the virtual world uh, with a stranger through the smartphone display, in that framework, going inside the smartphone framework, and forging a relationship regarding this physicality, regarding this sensuality. I feel a lot of sensuality and in non-contact feeling sensuality. What does that mean? That's what I was thinking of. And regarding this, something that never existed before, that kind of sense. So I think Exonimo has that kind of physicality and I think maybe that's very important. And excuse me, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about, Sebastian. Sebastian made a comment, I'd like to talk about that and his work. I looked at the images, the film, and yesterday I watched his presentation and today I went to his website and I saw his work. And in I listened to today's presentation and I thought, ah, oh, this is what Sebastian was thinking. It was very interesting. And before machines or mechanical machines and software and today algorithms, these are changing people's lives and changing their desires. And that's a problem. And there's oppression as well. So people and algorithms or software and the relationship itself, this is a very important theme. So how does the person, it's himself or herself think about this and the others, how do they think about it as well? There's that issue as well. And 
the presentation by Exonimo and by Sebastian, I listened to them and I thought about borders. And what I thought about the borders was being oppressed, or like Sebastian was talking about, talking about um, people being exploited. But I think maybe there's joy there as well. By doing this, people feel that it's worth doing. They feel motivated. And the works of Exonimo too, with others, meeting people makes your heart beat faster. And people say it's very difficult to meet strangers nowadays. But if you go to dating sites, you want to meet people. And then there are the new desires that keep on increasing. So but with both artists, there are the desires and then there's something that stops it and then there's oppression and then also liberation and the border in between so people have emotions and they can think about this but software and devices do not have emotions and they do not think so this may be a problem of um, interpretation because uh, you need to think about those things. I'm very sorry that this became a very long answer. Um, and can I say something here? Um, related to what I've said, uh, the border becoming blurred and the body and the sen our senses becoming extended. Uh, in the news two days ago, actually the Paralympians records have uh, broken the Olympians records and Sebastian also said that people becoming something like softwares and so the boundaries are being blurred and we may not be able to stop this movement and if we add AI into the mix uh, before AI controls us the capitalists behind the AIs will start controlling human beings and maybe we will see such things happening, but we won't be able to stop this flow. And then what is it that people want to leave behind as a legacy? I believe that will become very important. Sebastian, do you want to come and um, make some comments? Yeah, I can try maybe to add, or maybe I will just, yeah, I think I mostly agree that, um, or let's put it this way, I'm actually, I would say there is more hope than, than um, disappointment or fear from my side in like all these things blurring and mixing. And for example, like, I, th I, th I think the body is super important, but I'm not one to say, yeah, okay, finally, we can leave Zoom and can go back to away from keyboard, because I still think um, there is such a potential in morphing into something else when you're online and so on, even though there is less space for this. And, um, and I, but I, I think we artists always have to push and still find areas and ways to to where you can be a bit different or leave something behind and develop a new identity or whatever. And I think um, there will always be room to push for this. Hmm. I remember in Byung Chunham's article, uh, the Taiwanese virus, he mentioned uh, the pandemic has revealed the negative side effects of digitalization. Digital communication is a very one-sided, uh, attenuated affair. There's no gates, nobody. The mm -hmm. pandemic is ensuring um, that this essentially inhuman form of communication will become the norm. Um, and also the endless lonely work sitting in front of the screen increases self-exploitation. Uh, we tire because, because of the lack of social contact, of hugs, of bodily touch, um, and this physical distance amplifies our uh, present uh, crisis. So I want to know, how do you see this virtual and immersive technologies affecting our um, empathetic uh, cap capacities and what emotional responses might a computer communicated reality uh, precipitate? 
maybe I can I can say a word. Uh, I think it's questioning our the meaning of being human. You know that now the latest research in biology, uh, in uh, science, um, is uh, making us understand that plants, animals, uh, uh, we are all like living. So uh, it's what the philosopher called the moment of the living. And I think it is very interesting to experience that, uh, being at the same time all connecting uh, with internet and with uh, technology. So I think it's questioning what is to be human. And I think uh, we can say what also is to be an artist. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, recently, I've heard uh, a statement uh, claiming that artificial intelligence will make everyone an artist. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any comments to that. And this comment claiming that AI will uh, eradicate the, the privilege of creativity to everyone, um, just like blockchain can uh, reallocate uh, the, the, the dis distribution of wealth. Hi, you are. <laughs> but I am. Hi. Hi. So may I, um, as related to what Sebastian said, um, having hope, um, because artists have a role, yes, indeed. But the developers, what they do is, um, well, they have a goal, a purpose, and that is based on the economy and monetary system right now, and that doesn't change. What happens there and the bias of the algorithm, well, the algorithm bias, uh, when it is made, uh, the algorithm already has the bias of the developer, but the algorithm, uh, may run a wild and also other uh, things may uh, intensify. So this is a black box and people may not realize that the algorithm is running wild. Uh, about 10 years ago, this has been mentioned. And yes, I want to have hope, but we shouldn't let our guards down. Uh, that's what I think. So AI uh, changing everybody into artists, as I said at the outset, Boyce has said that um, everybody is an artist, but this is totally different. On the surface, AI may make us do it, which means that the AI has control of us. So it's all about how we use it, how uh, we understand the dangers of them, or else it would be totally meaningless because AIs will become artists. It's not the human beings that become artists, but the artwork, the contents, is, is it really creative? Uh, people, uh, the physicality or the sufferings that we have, that is at the basis of all the artworks. Uh, people may die, people may be ex become extinct, and that's where art was made. Um, that has been here since we lived in caves. And because we face death and we because we understand our limitation of our physical bodies, that's why we are able to create art. So if we think in that way, AIs becoming artists or making all of us artists is um, something that I don't think will be possible. Not only it's uh, horrible to see the aesthetic of a machine uh, producing an artwork, you know, uh, what have been sold at Christie's, it's more a marketing than a, an artwork. Uh, but there is uh, some time in interesting collaboration, like um, the young uh, developer, uh, Roby Barat, worked with a very famous uh, oil uh, painter from France, Ronan Barrault. And they, uh, Ronan Barrault is making skulls uh, for years, I mean, uh, 500 uh, oil painting of skulls. And he uh, worked with uh, Roby Barat that put all the skulls in the machine. And when they were happy with an image produced by the machine to match an oil painting. Uh, they were selling the um, uh, diptych, the artwork produced by the machine and the oil painting. And also it's the eyes of the artists that are choosing the best artwork produced uh, by the machine. 
the machine will never be an artist. Uh, we see uh, the whole uh, uh, horrible creation in music, in the music field made, made by AI, you know, some classical um, uh, symphony inachevé, you know, unachieved symphony. And then the a AI is finishing this symphony. This has no sense. It has no meaning. We will always love the unachieved symphony you know we don't need the ai to produce the last notes um, so i i believe uh, human artists are more than ever necessary uh, for the world we're living in as a whistleblower yeah mm, thank you and uh, i also want to put some comments uh, to uh, sebastian sharing because this uh, this presentation reminds me of a very uh, uh, popular uh, article titled delivery rider stuck in the system uh, this article starts with the mysterious event of missing time in system before uh, for a two kilometers del delivery, riders had, had 32 minutes and then it went down to 30 minutes. And in the past three years, delivery time within the same distance has reduced by an average 10 minutes. Um, so the system is capable of constantly eating uh, time. Uh, if data is the basis for training algorithms, if riders continue to uh, speed up, the algorithm will continue to compress the time. Um, the deep learning of AI algorithm is fatal to uh, delivery riders and the riders cannot fight the time that allocated by the system with, uh, with its personal power, but can only recover the overtime with their overspeed that has caused more traffic accidents uh, in the past few years. Um, so, the riders and their black box bus have uh, are, are caught in a dead loop in the infinite uh, acceleration. So I wonder um, how could the concept of humans and software extension could potentially um, affect uh, this situation? Yeah, so that that's completely true, and um, I think like innovation if you want to speak of that ever um these days is really simple you just say i do something that already exists but quicker so like in berlin the latest thing is like delivery in 10 minutes so that's not a great idea and it's terrible but that works and i think uh, the only way to do something about it is regulation there's nothing else basically I think we can talk about there is like riders protesting now and this is a really good thing and they need all the support but what they need basically is regulation otherwise as you describe it there will be like just like quicker and quicker and quicker and what like for riders it doesn't make any sense because if you ride quicker you don't make more money you're just being assigned assigned longer routes because you're the quicker person you can do a longer route in the same time and save money so that's actually a disadvantage for yourself okay uh sorry as we only have five minutes here we have a question in our chat box uh, I have a question regarding the nft hype and the labor aspect for artists uh, to self-promote themselves maybe NSSL and Sebastian could answer to that yeah it's difficult to promote yourself but um, there is only like 10 uh, platform right now on the nft art market so it's not like uh, you have to choose a gallery you can be on as many platforms as you want uh, there is one that is less consuming energy also because it's on the tezos uh, blockchain it's called ik et nunc uh, it has been created by the by a brazilian uh, developer and the other one is really a uh, uh is really like uh, the beginning you know i think also uh, some platforms are curated some others are not so it all depends how you want to promote yourself uh, but i think you can uh, right now uh, really self-promote uh, using um, the best uh, to promote yourself for nft is twitter and uh, instagram hmm. Yeah, I think multiple forms of additional income are uh, especially important for creative uh, workers. And I think that's where NFT is meaningful. Uh, artists and cultural workers need a new way 
uh, of income to support their practices, we need an invulnerable peer-to-peer -peer system to, uh, to fight uh, mass pre precarity amongst the creative workers worldwide. Um, uh, maybe maybe I can add something if there is yeah. time, but I don't want to steal any time. But yeah, um, Please. I think we have to yeah um, be be sure. I mean, this is about platforms, and then artists become content creators on this platform. So I was about to write an article called "What NFT Artists Can Learn from." workers on Fiverr because I think and I didn't write it but I think there is a clear parallel because like um, what does it mean that decentralization here is not a decentralization of money and income there is no redistribution not at all it's the same a few people get rich and the rest is just paying a fee to the platform which is a huge fee most of the times and so what this often uh, creates is something which I call survival creativity so you really have to come up with a piece, an artwork, or on Fiverr with a job that makes you money. It's really just that is the creativity to find something that makes money. And that is, I think, a totally different um, thing to having a practice that is like driven by ideas or inquiry or something. That being said, of course, I think I'm happy for everybody getting rich on M NFT. I'm <laughs> totally fine with me, but I think it's a big hustle as being on another platform and doing logos or something. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. Um, I think we are running out of time. Maybe one last question before we close today's uh, discussion. Uh, now we're living in a society where boundaries are inevitably and continuously blurred. Uh, but do you think it is necessary to set boundaries in such blurring? And if so, what kind of boundaries do we, do we need to establish? So there's not much time left, so maybe Exonima could keep it short. Yes, we have to leave at half past, so maybe you can speak first. Probably boundaries are not made, they are automatically born. And two different things might get close to each other, and there automatically a boundary will be born, and it will keep moving constantly. So what we are interested in is, where is the boundary now? So that's something that people can sense or feel. And constantly with the times, the boundaries will change. And we want to do research about them and check into them, which means that now human beings, what are human beings concerned about? Where are the problems you can start to see? So in that respect, boundaries are useful, I think. And boundaries are balance. And the pandemic means that national boundaries have been very, very strong boundaries. And under this situation, in the virtual space and real space, the boundaries have become more ambiguous. So taking, so there's a balance maintained in this way. So boundaries are created within balance and they automatically human beings will create them. So somewhere constantly there is a boundary, I think. I believe regarding this question and the ambiguous boundaries, I'm not quite sure what you mean. So the body and life and death, so there are boundaries there. And, and I don't want to talk about something complete, can, can be different, but in society, there are boundaries. And these are asymmetric. And because of COVID-19, regarding race, race or gender, there are lots of boundaries out there already. In the human world, there are lots of boundaries. And in the digital world, how can we, pro in a clever way, get rid of them? We need to make fundamental changes. And if we can get rid of them, and on the surface, it looks like you may think they are gone, but that's not true. To fundamentally get rid of them digitally, how can we use the digital world? We need to think about that. And to do this, art too can be useful, I think. But art has much, much larger, broader possibilities, I think. Um. Okay, um, just want to check if Sebastian and, or Anne still want to add something. 
Yeah, it's I just not. want to okay. quote uh, a documentary uh, called uh, We Are All Watched by a Machine of Loving Grace. And uh, it's very interesting. It was the beginning of the, this discussion about human machine. And uh, it's uh, the BBC. You can look at uh, the documentary online. It's uh, very interesting, uh, The Machine of Loving Grace. Okay, um, so thank you to our, our presenters today and thank you all for attending. Be sure to visit the exhibition uh, Hybrid by Nature to get to know more about the uh, exhibition concepts and the artworks. Tomorrow at the same time, gonna, we're gonna have the second uh, conference titled AI Human Machine Interaction. Uh, so enjoy re the rest of the Hybrid by Nature uh, conference. Uh, I want to hand it back to you, uh, Sabine, if you want to uh, share any additional information. Hi, thank you, Bichin. I'm stepping in for Sabine also to, to just uh, also thank you all for uh, being the participants of this um, session for your intriguing presentations um, that has given us a very diverse range, I think, of our entanglement with machines and blood boundaries uh, was very insightful and also thank you Vichin for the moderating of this uh, of the session and for the lively discussion and the very interesting aspects uh, you brought to surface um, so yeah please join us again tomorrow uh, we talk about AI human machine interaction uh, Vichin Min mentioned our guests will be Irini Papadimitriou uh, Shin Sang Baek and Kim Yong Hoon, Vesela Cook and Clemens Abrich, and the session will be facilitated by curator and researcher Iris Long. So good night to you all and see you again tomorrow. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Bye.